I decided in 1983 to consider public service. People had seen me giving speeches. I was on the Industrial Development Authority of Westchester County. We had a AAA bond. A lot of money goes into keeping businesses there. And one day I attended a breakfast, and who was at the breakfast? The chairman of IBM, the chairman of uh, Texaco, the president, Andrew Pearson. And a group of them called me and said, you know, we don't like our congressman. And we like what you're saying. Well, they, they were business people. They wanted to see good accounting. They wanted to see accountability. They wanted to see all the right things. And I said, well, what do you say? I was thinking maybe one day I'd run for the mayor of New Rochelle, but you're telling me you want me to run for Congress? Uh, if I went to the head of Arthur Anderson and said that, they would think that I was uh, smoking pot or something like that. Accounts just don't think of that. Well, long story short, my, I never was involved in politics, so I didn't have any loyalty with party forces. And I ended up taking all the parties on, getting involved in a huge uh, competition because I went against an incumbent who was there 14 years. He retires in the middle of the race. That's an open invitation for everybody who wants to become a congressman to jump in. But I had already announced that I was leaving the firm on the 30th of April, 1984. So I ended up winning that race by 1,000 votes on election day out of 300,000. A miracle. We had to count it three times. But look at the back of my article. See this? This is me, 1986, a junior member of the minority party. Reagan was president, but yet the Democrats control everything. The nerve, people were saying, Joe, what are you, crazy? You're coming in saying that Congress needs, the government needs a chief financial officer, a CFO? I said, absolutely. You can't believe these numbers over here. Now, why did I do that? Because it was Arthur Anderson that led the call for that, even before I got to Congress. And why don't we account for the loan programs, the guarantee programs in Congress? If you're a bank, you need to understand what your loss ratios are. You've got to show that. Now, as an expense of the liability, we don't do that. Look at the inside page. There's me with George H.W. Bush. I got it signed and passed in 1990. But typical to Washington, they dumbed it down. They took out the most incredibly important uh, principles, like generally accepted accounting principles, and where the CFO should have been was independent. They put it under OMB. This is what happens when you do something good. Congress, politics, finds a way with conflicts of interest to figure out if we're going to be forced to do it, and they were forced. Why? We had the SNL crisis in 1987. Without that crisis, they would not have run to sign on to a bill to show America, look, I'm working with this guy, Diogwadi. I want to see a fault, but behind my back, because they were the committee chairman, they cut out all the key provisions, which I'm now trying to bring back. This is on the website of Truth in Government. It's a whiteboard animation it's about two or three years old now, so it talks about the national debt at 17 trillion. You've heard the national debt. And by the way, don't believe that's the number. That's the statutory national debt. That's the number that they say we can't go above without getting permission to spend. But that number is based on the cash basis. Meet Johnny. Johnny's just a child, but soon he's gonna grow up and he'll want to achieve the American dream for himself and his family. But the way elected officials are spending money in Washington, Johnny's future is uncertain. We all know about the $17 trillion national debt, but what's really alarming is the $55 trillion in additional debt that the federal government has incurred in promised obligations. That's over $520,000 that Johnny owes alone. And Johnny's parents are most likely not aware of the costs of these obligations. That's because legally, politicians don't need to tell you about them. See, the basic difference lies in the accounting system Washington uses. Under the federal government's cash basis system of accounting, expenses are recorded at the moment they're paid. Whereas under a better accounting system, the accrual basis, an expense is recognized when a bill is received, even before it's paid. For example, when the government makes promises to senior citizens to pay Social Security, those expenses should be recorded when they're promised, and those promises need to be kept. So what's that mean for Johnny? Well, as a major accounting firm once put it, given the existing practice of cash basis budgeting and reporting, promises can be made without knowledge of their full cost. This creates an incentive for elected officials 
to curry favor with today's voters at the expense of tomorrow's taxpayers. This allows politicians to make promises without having to disclose how much they're really going to cost. This means that Johnny's future is being put in jeopardy by politicians who make unsustainable promises just to win votes. But so too is the financial health of our country. If you don't believe us, look at an independent study done by Stanford University in 2011. It ranks the most fiscally sustainable countries in the world. While Australia and New Zealand, which use accrual accounting, are ranked number one and number two, the United States is a dismal number 28. That's just ahead of near bankrupt Greece. Isn't the problem becoming clearer? The current way the United States government accounts for its bills is making the American future that much more uncertain. It's not a legacy we should leave for Johnny or any of our kids. If you were to put the unfunded liabilities as states now are required, why, why are the states finally required to put on the books the, a number, a liability for unfunded pensions, health care benefits, and whatnot? The rating services realize if we give these people AAA ratings like they have, and we don't put them on the books, we're going to be in trouble. What about the United States of America? We are the biggest borrower in the world. It's called treasury bills. All right? And, and, and that's a problem now. We still don't have on the books the unfunded liabilities. Just for Social Security, and it's 49 trillion. Round number is 50 trillion. So you got to add 50 trillion to 20 something, 21 trillion. And then you begin with the most conservative number of what our national debt is, if you are a real accountant. Let's get to ethics. What, what do you think of when you think of yourself as a good citizen? Well, someone who believes in principles. What's the principles of America? The Bill of Rights, the Constitution. We seem to be protecting it every day. Number two, uh, I believe that we should support those patriots who protected it, those people who got medals of honor, those veterans who gave up their lives, who risked their lives. It's important to understand that we must value the people who helped us protect the country, the Constitution. But finally, there's something else. I call it the social contract, a very tacit thing. It's, you have a family, you have children. What do you think about it? Well, my dad, my parents came from Europe. My dad came here in 1929 with no education. You're looking to leave something to your children. Take that to the national level. Aren't we thinking about the future? Don't we know that there's a whole generation of people who have no voice right now, some unborn, some born but don't vote? Don't we feel a fiduciary responsibility for these people to leave them a country that we inherited? Not trillions of dollars worth of debt. Worse than that, we don't even know what the debt is because we're not using the right accounting system. So how are we protecting the future? I had to bring it home to give you graphic information <coughs> that is gonna be mind boggling. Look at the title of my article. It's in the front part of that book. Here it is, The uh, American Dream in Crisis. The one trillion dollar annual interest payment is coming. You heard about the one trillion dollar deficit this year and a few more in the next 10. But in the 12th year, this is not Jody Aborty's numbers. I'm talking about the numbers that are independent from the Congressional Budget Office, not the Congressional uh, the Budget Committee. That's partisan. I'm talking about the CBO. The 12th year is projected one trillion. Where's the money coming from? How are we going to pay one trillion dollars in interest when we don't have the money now to pay the debt? It's like your kids in school. They, they run through 500 bucks, and the next thing you know, you're seeing Penalties and interest. There's no, you got to take the credit card away. Well, that's what we got to do. We got to take that credit card away, and I've identified that credit card as the congressperson's voting card. You'll see it on the front of my book. And by the way, before you leave, take a copy of my book when I left Congress, Unaccountable Congress, and you'll see what I put on the cover. A credit card that is a voting card. That voting card is plastic, just like your credit card. It goes in at the end of a row of seats, and that's what the votes do. They push up the national debt. So look at this one here. Projected national debt versus GDP. Look at this year, 2018. What do you have? You have the GDP at 20 trillion, but you have the 
national debt passed it by about a trillion dollars. And look at the transition. These are not my numbers. This is CBO. Look at now 10 years later, 2028. The national debt has gone to 33 trillion 800. By the way, this is cash. This is not with the unfunded liabilities. 33 trillion. And look at the gross domestic product, 29. So the debt easily surpasses that. That's one framework. Now look at this one. Annual interest costs on the national debt projected against defense spending. This is murder. This is going to become the end of the security of America. Look at 2018. $316 billion is the annual interest cost. Look at the defense cost. 622. Now go down 10 years. 2028. Interest rises to 915 billion. Remember I told you a trillion is coming? That's in the 12th and 13th year. This is the 10th year. 915 surpassing defense. What do you get for interest costs? You don't pay soldiers. You don't think of any strategies to save the country, mm -hmm. homeland security. It just goes to people who, many of them are enemies. We, we're borrowing from people we don't trust. In the old days, I used to blame it on Japan. Now it's China. It's, it's Lord knows how many countries don't really subscribe to our principles and we are borrowing. So we're putting us at risk in that respect too. And now look at this. Numbers are beautiful, but what's better is a chart that shows you the percentages. This is round numbers what we spent last year. What's that? $4 trillion. $3.9 trillion. 217, but it's the same number practically for 218. About $4 trillion. Look at the blue. 63%, that's mandatory. What does that mean? You can't change it. It's in stone until we have reforms, entitlement reforms, and other things, which we're not going to have. Because politically, it's called the third rail. You know that. Anybody starts talking about Social Security, right away, the other side says, oh, we're going to take away my Social Security. They don't say that maybe we're going to implement it so that it only hits people uh, over 35 coming into the market. That would change the unfunded liability because those are actuarial numbers. But you can't even get there. Nobody wants to hear it. So don't take away my Social Security. What about the kids? You're going to see a chart here that we are reducing the amount that we're spending on children like you can't believe. Now let's look at the big picture. Mandatory, 63%. Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid. Okay? Look at what Pat said, discretionary, 30%, the orange, what's that? That's everything that Congress deals with. You don't realize it. When you're turning on the TV and you're watching Congress, there's nothing being discussed in the blue. You can't discuss the gray, because that's the interest on the debt. By the way, that's another mandatory item. Try not to pay the interest and see how fast we lose our ability to borrow, okay? So basically, our mandatory is what? 63 plus seven. This is this year. In round numbers, 70 percent. That leaves you 30 percent. Half of that is defense. We're not going to reduce defense. We're increasing it. So what's going to suffer? Look at all these other items here: education, transportation, agriculture, veterans benefits, science, space, tech, homeland security. That's everything involved with your quality of life. That's all Congress deals with right now, plus defense. But defense has a big lobby. I'm going to show you at the end. Okay, now, I decided to show you what this looks like in 10 years. Has the blue changed? 1%. Has it changed? Well, look what has changed. Interest is going from 300 billion to not over nine. There it is. It's now 13% of total spending. What's total spending in 10 years? Again, this is not your rewarding numbers. This is Congressional Budget Office. Seven trillion plus. 13% of it now is interest. Let's stop for a minute. How did we get to 13% from 7? I'll tell you. Number one, the debt is going up. We're having trillion dollar deficits. That gets added to the debt. But number two, in order to look good now, all the treasury bills we redeemed, we short term them. So to get very favorable interest rates, because interest rates were what? Since 2008, practically zero. So we've now left ourselves open to the fact that if interest rates go up and we refinance,
We're refinancing at higher rates of interest on a lot more treasury bills. Those three factors are driving the interest in 12 years to $1 trillion, just the interest on the national debt. And look at discretionary, down to 23%. And half of that is it. the federal budget is for children. Just to let you know, just look at the book. I'm not going to hit these numbers. You can't believe if you look at what we're spending now versus what we spent before for kids and where we're going in 2048. Forget it. Our children are the ones that are not benefiting. The seniors are benefiting a lot. Look at this. This is the last uh, GAO report. Look at assets and liabilities at the top. The difference between the liabilities and the net position, three trillion. That's all the assets we have that you can value, three trillion. But look at the liabilities you have, 23 trillion. So our net benefit is 20. But then you gotta add this number at least, 49 trillion, what we owe if you had to fund Social Security so that people will get 100%. I compare this chart, it's in the back of the book, to show you where our debt came from. It started with the consolidation of the colony's debts, George Washington. It was paid off once by Jackson because of selling real estate. I got the numbers in nominal, and I got the numbers in 2018, so you can see what every president did to the debt to build it up or try to pay it off, which they've never done. And the bottom line is politicians are currying favor with today's voters at the expense of tomorrow's taxpayers. Who are tomorrow's taxpayers? Your kids, people not born. They don't care about that. That's why we're doing this. They want to get reelected. There is a conflict here. Why? The way, maybe the, the issue is to reform the electoral process. Because too many people are interested in those pensions. They want to stay in. They don't like to leave that power. There are no term limits. And therefore, the next generation is suffering because of that. Now, I went into the lion's den. You see this? This is the National Defense Forum at the Reagan Library, Simi Valley. I had to get one of my very wealthy donors to take me there. It cost $5,000 just to get in that door. But I figured this is where I had to make my stand. And I waited and waited. I saw how they were rushing. So I had to get up 15 minutes before they allowed me to ask that question. I'm a pretty articulate speaker. I think I know what I'm talking about. And I'm standing there with this thing in my hand for 15 minutes saying, how am I going to capture this group of people so that they understand that there's something important here? And who's the woman there? She is the chairman of this whole thing. Secretary of the Air Force. Where is this? Under President Reagan's 747 in the library. If you go up, you can see it's hanging on the ceiling. 600 lobbyists are there. The defense industry. You talk about a voice, you talk about a lobby, and all the generals are there. Nobody goes here. But I had someone take a camera and take me. The requirement for financial statements, the act that I introduced, started in 1994. The Controller General, in his report, the last statement put out, says that the armed services, the DOD, will not be able to comply and get an opinion because there are such material weaknesses in the way you account for things and you want more money. So is there a question in there? The question is, why is it taking so long? I mean, it's not rocket science accounting. You got to get the right people in to there to try to figure out why you can't get an okay. audit of the DOD. Secretary James and Dr. Zakhan. Um, I'm going to, rather than try to explain why, I'm going to agree with you. It has taken too long. And I mentioned briefly that this is something we're hard, uh, working hard on in the Air Force. It, we're working hard across the Department of Defense, including Frank, Bob Work above him. I think. Stay tuned very shortly, like within the next year, you're going to see that we're going to have major advances. We're going to get there. Thank you.